Okay, recording is happening. Okay, and before we uh, launch our feature presentation, uh, here are a, are a list of uh, upcoming uh, talks. Uh, March 7th, we're going to hear about chronic liver diseases and cirrhosis uh, in N3C uh, involving uh, uh, use of, as well as PPRL training by uh, uh, Jin Gee and Sean O'Neill. So, um, and then March 14th, use of mortality data and uh, PPRL, patient preserving privacy uh, linkage, record linkage uh, by uh, Jasmine Pua and Umberto uh, Tacanardi. And I think actually the uh, consortium PPRL paper is getting pretty close to uh, to going out as well. So that's good. Monthly Recover Long Island uh, project team, long COVID uh, project team updates by uh, Melissa and Emily. Uh, March 21st, uh, ML training workforce uh, and benchmarking ethical AI by Susan uh, Greg Gurek. And then uh, March 28th and April 4th, good algorithm practice by David Sarner and uh, Johanna Lumba, and then finally April 11th, rare diseases in ORDR uh, by Melissa uh, Hendel and uh, Brian uh, Laraway. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we have almost four and a half million COVID uh, cases, uh, records for almost four and a half COVID uh, cases uh, in, in the enclave um, with uh, 12.2 million uh, people overall. It's quite uh, remarkable. Next, next slide. Okay, so um, so uh, looking forward to uh, presentations and update on the uh, publications committee. I think Mary, your your uh, your yes. Your first. I think I'm going to start. I'll kick this off, and then if I could have my first slide, please. Or do I need to screen share, Julie? What? Uh, I think you need to screen share, yes. Okay, let me let me try this. This is always a challenge. Let's see. Um, here we go. Now, uh, let me see. Sorry about this. It shouldn't take me. Share screen, good. And now, there, is that? Uh, Not yet. Do you see it? No? No, not yet. Nope, not yet. Hmm. Okay. Julie, maybe you could, let me try this again. Uh, how about now? Now you should see it. Yes. Okay, excellent, yep. excellent. Okay. Well, I thanks everybody. Sorry for that uh, technical glitch. Um, I am Mary Saltz and I, I'm uh, co-chair of the N3C Publication Committee with Julie McMurray. And uh, Julie and I are going to talk to you today and are delighted and grateful that Jeremy is going to also uh, talk to you all a little bit about some of the challenges that we've seen. We just talked to you in the summer. So we have some updates uh, for you. First and foremost, that we need to see everything that goes out, including uh, podium presentations. And this is new. Uh, but that's something that we'll uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about more. The the uh, forms I don't believe have been changed yet, but we will be uh, asking to see everything that goes out. So, what have we learned since the summer, and what can we update you about? And it's interesting as we've gone along, we've been learning quite a bit, and I would like to introduce. First, the committee members, then talk a little bit about what does it mean? How can you create an impactful paper in N3C? Jeremy and I will talk about that. And then we will hand off to Julie, who is uh, absolutely amazing at uh, making sure that the wheels keep turning to get all of the information to the publication committee and from us back out to the authors. It's an unbelievably difficult job. And uh, she's going to remind us all 
what the process is and tell us a little bit about where you can find policies and author resources if you are trying to or wanting to submit a, a manuscript. I just briefly, I'm not going to introduce each and every committee member, but we are a very cohesive group who work very well together. Uh, Christine and Julie uh, help lead this group. And Jeremy is of course an invaluable member, but without everybody else, we would not function. And if there are any people in the audience who would like to join us in the committee, we would really welcome your participation. It's a very interesting place. We see all of the work that is being done at N3C as it comes to fruition and is ready to go out into the world. And it's very, very interesting work indeed. And we've learned quite a bit over the time that we've been doing this about what we think really goes into a successful paper. So as you can see, this is out of date. It's like 12.2 million patients now, this was, uh, what a snapshot I took on the web yesterday, but it's already out of date. Every day this, uh, these metrics are out of date because we get more and more patients in the enclave. And the point is not how many, the point is that it's really a lot of data. It's complex. There are variations in the way the data is collected, where it was coded, how it's shared. And we suck in all of this and try to make sense of it. But there is variation in where the data comes from, how it's collected. And all of that is very important to understand when you're putting a paper together. So what do we do as a committee and what do we not do? These are the things that we look at and vote on each time we get together and review a paper. Is this paper about N3C? Is it about methodology that was created and developed specifically for N3C? And if we think that it is, uh, then it gets special attention. We want to make sure that it's accurate and fair and represents N3C appropriately. So that's the first thing that we look at. The second thing that we look at is, is the DUR appropriate to the work submitted? Sometimes there's more than one DUR. Sometimes we have a little bit of trouble making sure that we feel comfortable that the DUR actually covers the work that was done. So far, we've not had a problem where we could not work this out. The other thing that we try to do is be the last set of eyes on cell sizes. There's a whole process that goes into the data being uh, downloaded, et cetera, and a data download committee. But we are one last set of eyes on the tables to make sure that the cell sizes are not less than 20, that you can't back calculate to less than 20. And if indeed the cell size is less than 20, but the authors feel that it's important for the science to specify a number less than 20, then that needs to get special permission from, um, from N3C. We also look at the native populations to make sure that if specific reference is made to native populations, that it's done in a way that acknowledges the NIH Tribal Council's role in the representation of the data. And then we also look to see, is this paper really wonderful? Is it fabulous? Is it not, you know, it's good, but not necessarily earth shattering. Uh, so if it's extremely significant, then central resources can be dedicated to the paper. And also uh, the, this committee here, the uh, Monday evening uh, lectures, have been, uh, we tend to recommend some publications to be presented here that are really extraordinarily good. And then we also try to make sure that this is not overlapping work with other groups at N3C because we're a central funnel. We see everything that comes through and we try to foster collaboration if we see points of, um, if we see points of um, overlap. We are not a peer review group. Um, that is not what we do. However, we do try to help, and we are quite familiar with the best practices of N3C. We work very closely with the authors and governance to make sure that the papers that are about N3C are of the highest standard. And 
we'd like to talk to you today a little bit about what we think are 10 steps to N3C publication success. Kind of put our heads together as a committee in our last meeting and talked about what is it that we think really makes a paper excellent. And these are our 10 steps or our 10 things that we think should be addressed and carefully looked at in every paper. And we will go through these one by one. In the methods section, and oh, thank you so much for that diagram. I, uh, I really appreciate that. This clears it up tremendously. Uh, this diagram shows you the idea of what we're talking about here, that we must describe the selection criteria and exactly who constitutes the cohort under discussion. Um, let, sorry, let me just make that smaller. Yes. So we look to see here, you can see that from 2 million plus COVID patients, the proper age group was selected. And from that, uh, three sites, in other words, you narrow down from the entire population to the cohort under consideration in the paper. You need to be specific about exactly when and where you're pulling these from, what are the dates, and is this level uh, two or level three data. And the variables need to be very clear, and a footnote can go a long way to clarifying exactly what you're talking about. And this is, this is something that we've struggled with a little bit, but when you read a paper, we should understand exactly what a term means and any acronyms. And the terms should clearly reflect without bias, the cohort under consideration, the terms describing actions should be very clear and should not reflect a point of view, but rather a very uh, straightforward description of what is being discussed. When you find outcome disparities, you need to be very careful to consider all possibilities. It's very important for us to look at disparities and outcomes and see why and how this may be, but we need to consider all of the possible reasons. Just one example is the difference between race and ethnicity and how that can influence uh, our findings. The figures, this is obvious, it goes without saying that all the table headers, figure axes must be understandable wherever practical without a legend. Are the numbers percents, odd ratios, individual patients? So the figure should stand on its own and be visible, legible, and understandable. All current literature, this is another no-brainer, should be cited, but in particular, people need to be very careful to make sure that they've looked for any publications coming out of N3C that might be relevant. Those definitely need to be cited. And Jeremy, I think from here, this is, um, oh no, I think this is still mine. Uh, this one you had given to me. I thought I, okay, Jeremy, you're much more qualified, so take it away. Thanks, everybody. So as you're thinking about all the different sites, uh, we're a very large database with lots of multi-site contributors. Uh, think about what you're doing and what I'm here to talk about today, I should preface all this with, is as you're doing your analysis, we have caught papers that have uh, gotten to the point of publication and found where people uh, did not realize quite the complications that uh, have come up with our <laughs> very large uh, database. And so we want to make sure that you're all thinking about these things as you're working towards your publication. If you're going to say that certain therapeutics are being uh, applied uh, well or not well, um, and I, we just moved this slide forward. Yeah, sorry, no. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, dear, dear. Let me, let me see so how. Yeah, to... I'll go from memory. Backwards. If backwards. Thinking about therapeutics, uh, you want to think about the, the fact that 
uh, at certain points in the pandemic, certain areas of the country may have or may not have had access to those therapeutics. And you need to be able to marry uh, some of that larger knowledge in with the database uh, because it's not in the database itself to say that people in Ohio or people in Indiana where I live uh, didn't have access to something. Uh, you wanna control for those temporal variations. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of people do analyses around ECMO. And before you can say that uh, COVID is being denied ECMO or being prioritized for ECMO, uh, you have to have a better understanding of how many people in the hospital are having ECMO. And because we get everyone who is um, inpatient, we have, a, or I'm sorry, everyone who has COVID, we have a very strong uh, COVID visualization, but we don't have a strong visualization of everyone else at the hospital at that current time who is getting ECMO. And so we can't necessarily draw correlations over uh, clinical decision-making um, in a lot of cases because we just don't have the full picture for a full health system. As you're thinking about all these different sites, remember that uh, each site contributes data at their own cadence. Uh, some of that data uh, could be the data from last week. It could also be data that hasn't been updated for six months. And uh, we leave it to you as the investigator to go in and actually do some analysis uh, to make sure that you are controlling for those confounders. So if you are including sites that uh, their contribution may be a little older, uh, you need to take that into account because uh, any outcomes data that you're going to report on, um, anyone who is in your cohort has the potential of skewing and we've seen it skew uh, some uh, research and then people had to go back and redo some analyses. Jeremy, can you also speak to the date shifting, please? Uh, date shifting. Uh, so this, uh, I think I have this on uh, another slide as well. Apologies, uh, we have okay. both a level two and a level three instance. In level two, uh, and you should all be familiar with this as you're requesting, uh, we date shift. We date shift plus or minus 180 days. It's internally consistent to the patient, but you won't actually know where they've been date shifted. So if you're trying to report on outcomes data, you are going to, and this is getting less relevant as we get farther along, but you are going to have patients that uh, you're not going to be able to identify in level two who uh, have not aged far enough into the environment to actually report on outcomes data. And so it has the potential of skewing your information. Um, so think about that as you're looking at uh, doing your analysis. Every time that you write a paper, we are looking to see, are you informing us? Are you in a level two or a level three environment? Are you uh, going through and telling us uh, the dates that you selected, the dates that you pulled the data, the dates uh, that you did the analysis uh, so that someone could come back and redo the analysis at some future point? Next slide, please. So as we're thinking about all this, you also need to think about uh, <laughs> the missing data, uh, the data that may not be there. We're coming from a lot of different types of databases. We've got organizations from ITB2, Pacorna, OMOP, uh, Trinetics. Um, and I, I just want to pull out a couple examples. One you see here is the nursing data. Uh, we've got some sites who individual hospitals within their sites are contributing nursing data that gets mapped into OMOP. Uh, but not all the different uh, care sites within their site are actually mapping that data. And so if you're trying to run an analysis on nursing documentation, you might have some surprises uh, when you try and generalize to an entire organization. Uh, so as you're looking at it, you need to keep in mind all that missing information. An example from the logic liaisons meeting earlier today uh, that I thought was a great example of missing data is uh, in some ambulatory encounters, we have start date, end date, and in some ambulatory encounters, we don't have an end date. And it all just depends on your system. And, uh, you know, we have some 
uh, contributors who might be Cerner, Epic, and all script shops. And so it depends on your vendor uh, for what gets mapped and how it gets mapped. So when you think about all of these things, don't forget about the missing information within the system. And if you don't have someone uh, who you think can help you think through that, uh, we do have the Logic Liaisons group, and you should be uh, talking to them uh, to help think through uh, some of this. Uh, next slide, please. I'm busy pointing my arrow to jump to the next slide. <laughs> so here's another area that um, is just tremendously important. When you're doing your analysis, uh, we need to think about doing accounting for the differences between groups. We want to compare like to like. So if you're talking about age, sex, degree of illness, uh, no matter what you're doing, um, if you're going to report on outcomes by these different groups, uh, you need to be able to show how similar or different they are. So you need to look at things like average age, the number of comorbidities, uh, we've seen a couple papers do a phenomenal job with this, but a lot of papers are uh, not taking that extra step. And uh, next slide, uh, we've had examples um, where uh, people who have done these extra steps, uh, we've seen 10 plus year age gaps between the average and the median uh, for race and ethnicity. And, and as you might imagine, if you think about it, if uh, you know, the Caucasian population is averaging 10 years older, maybe they're going to see more interventions. But if you have a uh, another population that is averaging 10 years younger, and you're seeing a, a small blip on the radar of your uh, analysis that says, oh, they're just a little worse. Um, they may be a lot worse when you take into account that they are uh, such a big disparity in uh, their ages. And, and so we've just seen a lot of uh, research reports that people will quickly slice and dice by race, ethnicity, sex, um, but they don't do that extra step of uh, ensuring that they're comparing like to like. And so it's just an important thing uh, that as we were talking about as a committee, uh, we've gone back to a lot of papers and reminded them that, uh, you know, when you slice by any of these types of things, you need to make sure that uh, we're actually talking about people who look and feel similar. Um, next slide. So as we continue to think about unknown vac information, I just want to call out vaccination. So vaccination, as you know, is uh, special. We've done a lot of work to go pull vaccination status in. Understand that it has a lot of missing information. Uh, we are working within a lot of groups to define uh, general vaccination status uh, so that um, you'll have some tables where you can more quickly say, okay, if they've had these uh, drugs within the tables, uh, it's the vaccines. But you also need to take into account that a lot of people are getting vaccinations outside of their local hospital system. Some healthcare systems are then uh, linking to their public health databases to be able to pull in vaccination status, some are not. And, and so uh, we know for a fact that vaccination positive status underrepresents the number of actual vaccinated in individuals at all sites. And it potentially is drastically undercounting depending on your local area and exactly uh, how integrated you are with public health. And so there are a number of people who are doing a lot of good work uh, around vaccination status. If it's something that is of interest and you haven't been talking uh, to anyone about it, uh, please hit me up on Slack and I'll get you connected uh, to a number of different folks who've really done some deep dives in this. And I think that's my last slide, but next slide. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, and Julie, I think that from here on in, it's, uh, it's up to you. Terrific. So uh, the first thing I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of before we sort of launch into some of the review 
is that we now want to see everything, whether it's a, an abstract or presentation or podium, you know, whatever it happens to be, there is a lot of confusion in people's minds around what we need to see. And so we've just made the decision to look at everything before you submit, whether it's to the conference or what have you. However, I don't want you to freak out. I know that conference turnaround times are very short. And part of our goal here is to make sure that the authors themselves are self-policing to a large degree so that the, you know, it, it'll walk you through, have you looked at this? Have you looked at this? Have you looked at this? And so the process of submitting is not meant to thwart your submission to the journal or the conference or what have you. Um, but in the case of podium presentations and abstracts, uh, it, it, we, we will look at them if we, if we have the, the time to get, get back to you within, you know, like one business day kind of thing. But for podium presentations and abstracts, um, it is a, a sort of self-declaration kind of thing. Um, but we just want the ability to know what's going on, uh, what's being presented, and be able to intervene uh, if we see something that looks like it might be problematic, intervene before it's actually um, been accepted and presented. So all full length manuscripts, however, still go through the same process. So before you submit, whether it's to a preprint server or to a journal or a full manuscript to a conference, we need to see all of that uh, beforehand. Um, we tend to get manuscripts in various stages of completion. Um, we like to, you know, have enough time to review it. And so therefore, if it's a little bit scruffy in terms of the language or, you know, the, the, the figure may not have the right colors or whatever, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Earlier and scruffier is better provided it is complete. And when I say complete, I mean, all of the tables, all of the figures, all of the data that you are presenting in whatever form needs to be the final numbers. It doesn't need to be the final colors, the final order or any of that. It just needs to be the final content and your conclusions need to be your final conclusions. And from there, we can talk about how it can be improved. Um, but what I, what I wanna make sure that we don't get is, okay, we finally finished. Now we're ready to submit to the journal in 48 hours. That doesn't really give us enough time and then, then you're waiting on us. So, um, so that's, that's uh, just wanted to clarify that one thing. So from here, if you attended August's presentation, uh, you are free to go at any time. No, uh, no one will be watching you drop off and, and, and wagging fingers. Um, it's review. I've also posted the link to the slides if you wish to review them. But for anybody who um, maybe didn't get to see our presentation in August or is otherwise um, curious about how we work and what the timelines are and that sort of thing, uh, feel free to stay on. So uh, next slide, please. Mary? Oh, sorry. Would you like me to um yeah, why don't share you them directly? Over here? Yeah. But there okay. you go. If you could stop sharing, I'll share my screen. I will, I will, I will, I will stop sharing. There we go. Thanks, Julie. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, present. Sorry. I'm trying to escape from full screen because it's not. Come on, you can do it. There we go. Okay, let's try this again.
Okay. So this Mary went over already in terms of what the um, committee is looking at. Your responsibility as authors is to sort of pre-attest to the court in accordance with the DUR, um, uh, giving us an idea of the consortial author attribution um, in terms of who, who you'd like us to invite on that front, um, including the acknowledgements, making sure that you have already checked to see if your content overlaps with any other um, manuscripts that are in process or, or published already and that you have obeyed the, uh, the download policy. So similarly with the self-attestation part uh, with the podium presentations and posters, you are self-attesting to concordance with the DUR, um, acknowledgements, overlaps, et cetera. And the committee's role is both to promote and track presentations that are accepted so that we can let everybody know how to see your wonderful work um, but also just as a secondary check to make sure that the, that the content um, makes, you know, it is actually um, um, concordant with policy. So your paper writing efforts really start way upstream of us. And um, I just wanna put a plug in here to um, make full use of the domain teams as you're pulling things together, because that will, really help to reduce the amount of uh, duplicative efforts um, and, and ensure you're kind of, you have a, a home for your science. When you've submitted a download request, the, the data download committee is the one to approve those downloads. However, we request that you make it easy for them. <laughs> and by making it easy for them, you also make it easy for us um, because it's important that they understand what the data mean. Um, and so make sure that all of the title, the, the headers of the columns are uh, expressive enough to, to understand what is in the content. Um, and we frequently will get manuscripts that are still ambiguous at the stage of manuscripts. So it's that much harder for the download committee in the absence of that context to understand what in the world it means. Um, once you have drafted your manuscript, you complete the publication intent form, which is linked from both the publication dashboard on the, on the website, as well as this slide deck. So here's our typical timeline. We ask for typically 12 business days to review applications. Um, we meet on Thursdays. So in order to really ensure that, that we've got enough time to review, we ask that you, um, you know, submit the Friday before the Thursday so that we can have the committee members give a, a thorough review before we meet on that Thursday. Um, and then domain team invitations are sent or uh, you know, core contributor um, uh, invitations are sent for consortial authorship and, and acknowledgement. And we give them three days to get back to us. And then we give the results back to you as the author. I also wanna mention the, the attribution workflow that we have um, is meant to be inclusive, but it is also not meant to be um, like radically directive. You as the authors of the paper have the best sense of who needs to be acknowledged, who needs to be included, et cetera. We just um, have a sort of default workflow that includes everybody and, and you can decide from there um, what you think is most appropriate. For instance, if there's overlap between the people you're acknowledging and the people that are on the paper, they don't need to be both acknowledged and, and authors, for example. So this is what the publication intent form looks like. Most of you have seen this before and it will be updated to reflect the fact that we're gonna be seeing everything from here out. Once you have submitted the intent form, um, if you can email the publication itself of those attachments to this email address, and, um, and then we will upload it to Google Drive and share it with 
uh, folks who have been invited to consortial authorship and or attribution. Um, that is done on a paper by paper basis. Someone has to request access to the paper. We need to confirm that that person is authorized to be one of the people that sees it. We don't just share publications with whomever. Um, we know that they are uh, confidential and we treat them with care. Um, we covered this already earlier. Um, so the required acknowledgements include the ICMJE statement and the acknowledgement statement, which is on the um, on the N3C website. It's like covid.cd2h.org forward slash forward slash acknowledgements. Um, and then if you are an author, if any of the authors that reside in an IDEA state, regardless of their institutional affiliation, the um, acknowledgement for the IDEA program award also needs to be present. So I would like to review this three-tier acknowledgement hierarchy that we have. So masthead authorship is just regular old vanilla authorship as you've known and loved. Um, it is substantial, intellectually important contributions made directly to that manuscript. And the only people invited at that level are exclusively at the direction of the contact and senior authors. So we as the publication committee, nobody gets to say this is a masthead or this isn't. Like that is, that's not our role. Consortial collaborators um, have less substantial but still intellectually important contributions, whether they are made to the study or manuscript or to knowledge artifacts that are directly used by the study. Um, these names may occasionally overlap with the in-text acknowledgements, but it will, you know, whether they belong in in-text acknowledgements or as consortial collaborators probably depends on how important that contribution was to the paper itself. The folks that are invited at this level are all of the co core authorship blocks. So everybody that is on that <clears throat> acknowledgements page on the website and any selected domain teams that the authors have said are relevant to that manuscript. So the publication committee notifies those those people, and then alerts the contact author of any responses. So we do this on your behalf because we realize it's a lot of people, it's a lot of moving parts, and we collect the, uh, the declarations and we give them to the authors. And from there, it's the author's uh, prerogative to include or exclude anyone um, on the basis of their contributions. For the in-text in acknowledgements, this is important contributions directly to the N3C infrastructure overall. And we maintain this list and we notify those core contributors of, of any manuscripts and those people can opt out of any manuscript that they maybe take issue with for any reason. Um, and so if anyone does opt out, the contact author will be given the redacted pasteable text. Um, that doesn't happen very often, but just, just so you know. So this list I think is actually out of date at this point. Uh, definitely look at the one that is on the website instead. Um, this is how you find the information about the publication review process. It's right on the website. You go to get in or resources and then publication review. And your uh, subsequent links will be found from there. So the publications tab of the dashboard has all of the current publications that are either in process or have been submitted. And that's where you would look to assess any overlaps. Um, it's also a good idea to reference any public published N3C papers relevant to your work because it's less words you fewer words you have to put on the page yourself if, if they're 
Um, there's something specific to the methodology or to the cohort characterization, et cetera. Um, but also it strengthens the overall program's work and uh, visibility. And here's some important links. And I think that's the last, the last um, slide, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, okay. I will um, happily open it up for questions and we can find the right person for you. So let's see if there are any in chat right now. Looks like there was one question, but it was addressed. Are there any other oh, questions folks have? So I, I have a sort of question and a comment and thanks for these great presentations. Sure. Um, so the um, review of abstracts, podium presentations and, and, and uh, things along those lines, um, I, I, th I think you stated it pretty clearly, but it, it is something that is gonna be a new workflow for a lot of people. So I think it's probably worth a little bit more discussion. So, so let me describe what I think I heard from 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 the presentation, which is, uh, but I may be wrong. Which is so a day a day before an abstract or a podium presentation or something relatively short goes in, then the authors will submit this, and basically, no news is good news if, if they don't hear anything. Uh, uh, by submit time, then life is okay. And if the committee has an issue, then they will um, respond and say, look, you know, this is, is, is that is that correct? Yes. We do not want anyone to miss a deadline because we weren't able to turn it around in short order. Um, there is a possibility that no news is, uh, no news is good news for submission, but no news may not be good news for downstream. Like it could be that if it's accepted, we nevertheless have to work together and get something right. right. Um, uh, but at least we would know earlier uh, than I'm presenting at 3 p.m. Can you look at my slides? <laughs> or being in a presentation where something is presented and, and no one had a chance to look at it. And there are cell size issues, for example. Um, those well, are the other thing to just to call everyone's attention to is uh, yes, it could stop the process if you haven't uh, requested your download permissions. Uh, we've had uh, situations where people did not think about the fact that they need to request download permissions. And when they've gone through the forms, they realized, oh, yes, I have to have permission before I can use any data out of N3C. Yeah for any reason. And, and I just wanna reiterate that the word download was probably the wrong word choice in the beginning and now we're kind of stuck with it. Um, but any data of any kind, table, figure, uh, you know, even a specific number of patients in the pros, um, all of those things need to have an approved download before they can leave the enclave in any way, screenshot, anything. So um, it's really about export and presentation more than download per se. I think people have a very narrow idea of what that means. So just be very careful. No, I think you're right. I think that a lot of people think that it means downloading and that if one manually copies, <laughs> it's okay. That right. it was an unfortunate word that stuck early on. Um, mm -hmm. So another related question, okay, so somebody um, who is giving a um, presentation um, submits an abstract, the abstract says, I'm gonna talk about X, Y, Z. Then the talk gets accepted, the talk rolls around. Uh, in almost all cases, there's gonna be data uh, that was not in the abstract that's, that's gonna right. be in the presentation. So what is the workflow associated? Now, ob obviously, if the table has a bunch of um, cell sizes of two, that's probably not so good. So what's, what's, what's the workflow associated with accepted abstract 
time rolls around for the presentation, how is that supposed to work? Mm -hmm. So for it's a little bit different for abstracts versus presentation. So podium presentation, you would expect to have many slides in which there is an appearance of data at some point in that in that set. So uh, it would be someone would would before they actually do the submission, uh, submit these the data that they intend to present. Now, again, at this point, all we're looking for is compliance with cell size. That's it. And so one presumes that data would be the cornerstone of the, of the presentation and that part of it would be ready early. And so as soon as all of the data that you intend to present is present in a presentation, if you can send us that, uh, that set of things, that's all we would need to see before it's uh, approved to be presented. Um, it, it is occasionally the case that data um, uh, get refreshed between the time we've seen a paper and a time that it is that it needs to go out. And so um, the way that we have handled that situation is that if it's a refresh, uh, but there are no new categorically new downloads, um, we don't need to see the full manuscript again. Um, if there are brand new downloads, just like entirely categorically different kinds of things that are being downloaded, then we do need to see everything again. Um, does that does that answer the question adequately? Oh, that's great. No, I mean, okay. I, I I think I think it's I think it's just useful to have a little bit of discussion um, about totally. this. I know I know there's. Um, uh, and, and endless, endless detail that can be generated, but I, I, I think uh, people um, get get the idea. Thank you. Yeah. So okay, so we have some some interesting action uh, in the chat uh, window. So so Jeremy, you'd like to um, address a question? So I, I was very excited. Hannah asked a question that I failed to cover very well, and she asked if the data partner looks like they're updating on a monthly basis, but the data is six months old. Uh, given the date shift of level two data, how would an N3C analyst be able to identify a data partner and correct for the out-of-sync data? So uh, with the SKU within level two, I would not recommend doing an analysis that's going to be impacted by that. Uh, let me talk through just how uh, this data is generated. It's generated within an electronic healthcare record every night for all the major vendors. That electronic healthcare record dumps out into a SQL warehouse. Uh, that SQL warehouse is where we as researchers typically can uh, then access the clinical data. Some uh, sites update on a quarterly basis, some update nightly. Uh, it's going to depend on the site. Uh, they apply their ETL. That ETL could be something that can run in six hours. It could also be something that can run over the course of two months uh, to convert, say, from uh, Epic Clarity into OMOP. Uh, once that effort to compile it into their local uh, environment, Coponet, uh, OMOP, uh, whatever uh, you want to call it, uh, or whatever it is, uh, then they have to take that data and ship it to N3C. Once it's in N3C's hands, we have a very fast turnaround where it gets into the Enclave, I believe the next Monday, maybe the next Tuesday. Uh, but it is very quickly ingested. All the scripts are available on GitHub. Uh, for everyone. But uh, there are going to be some sites who you can't just rely on the manifest table because they submit the same data on multiple occasions, updating the manifest table, saying that they are willing and able partner uh, who are supplying the data. Uh, and the manifest table says that it's been most recently submitted, but the actual data in the underlying uh, data that they're providing is a little older. Great. No, well, that's fantastic. Thank you. And let's see, Johanna, um, do, do you want to uh, cover what what uh, what she has to say? Or Johanna, are you are you a um, panelist? Okay. Well, Johanna says even in level two, you can eliminate sites with stale data by using the manifest table and removing all patients who belong to the stale sites. Each 
patient's data partner is listed in the in the uh, person's table. Um, so her question uh, in follow up about the run date. So that was some of the work that Jared Anslone uh, did uh, and myself as well, uh, that we presented at Logic Liaisons. Uh, it is often accurate, but if you are relying on its accuracy, it is not accurate for every site. Okay, no, this is great. So there's a question by uh, Matthew uh, Galbraith. Uh, please clarify the definition of conference abstract slash presentation versus internal presentation. So this is directed at anybody. Sure. Just to clarify it. Okay, Jerry. Um, this, this gets a little bit into like gray area. I would say if you're in doubt, just you know, chuck it over the fence. It's mostly self-attestation anyway. Um, and so it's a good checklist to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, outside of the bounds of policy, regardless of the venue. That said, um, I would say if it's really to an N3C specific audience, um, we wouldn't necessarily need a form response in every instance. I, I would say though that this venue is probably one where we do want to make sure that we we're looking at the, the data before it's presented just because it tends to be highly um, attended. You know, we have anywhere from 80 to 200 people and we wanna be sure that we are uh, doing our best to, um, uh, you know, just comply. That said, if you're just presenting to like four of your pals on the domain team, you don't need to submit a form response. I think that's overkill. Um, just nevertheless, keep these things in the back of your head, no matter who you're presenting to for any reason. Right. Okay, do we, do we have any, uh, any other questions, comments, thoughts? Um, you can always, if you think of questions later on, go ahead and send them to n3c.pubs at gmail and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. All right, thanks. we'll give you, uh, give people five minutes back and uh, right. thanks for some great, great presentations. That was very, very enlightening, thanks. Thanks, bye. Have a good week. Bye.